This is Robert Kraft, and I'm your host on SNN Network. And with me today, my guest is Jerry Fragon. He is the Chief Investment Officer at Taylor Fragon Capital Management. Jerry, it's good to see you. How are you doing? Good to see you, Robert. Doing great. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you back on. So uh, to get right into it, for, for those who may have missed our podcast interview, let's get your background and a quick synopsis on Taylor Fragon Capital Management. Sure. Uh, so I've been 34 years in the investment business. I spent 21 years in the San Francisco Bay Area with Merrill Lynch, um, managing portfolios primarily for high net worth individuals and started Taylor for Gone a little over 13 years ago. Um, Dave Matheson, who's our director of research, and I both uh, left Merrill together and uh, continued on this practice of, of managing uh, portfolios and growth companies that, uh, frankly, I've been doing uh, 34 years is, is stretching it about probably about 26, seven years ago is when we really got serious about managing specifically growth portfolios. Uh, took a few years to get my bearings, but uh, here we are now, um, 13 years into this experiment and um, driving forward in a, you know, really what is a classic growth style of investing, investing in the business, not trying to trade stocks. Uh, we also run a venture capital partnership as well, so we make investments in, in private companies um, as well as public companies. Got it. And and before I get to some of my, my other questions that I have for you, just real quick to follow up. Again, this is from the podcast, but just wanted to give a quick synopsis. You know, real briefly, what would you say is the firm's main investment philosophy? You mentioned growth style of investing. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, for us, the the process of making investments in, in companies is just that we're not, when I said earlier, you know, we don't trade stocks. We really don't view it as buying stocks. Now, you know, the, the, the fact is, is the beauty of public stock investing is that you can buy into businesses in, in with fractional pieces of the business relatively easy. And you have a reasonably decent amount of liquidity uh, for when you want to get in and when you get out. Uh, but we really approach it Similarly uh, to what you've heard in the past, perhaps with the the Graham and Dodd style, what Buffett talks about of buying the business as opposed to buying the stock. And our tradition or our our history comes from um, our my mentor in the business, uh, Dick Taylor, who's now deceased. He died actually in 2004. Was my father-in-law, um, and was one of the first portfolio managers back, or one of the early portfolio managers, I should say, back with T. Rowe Price in the 60s working side by side with Thomas Rowe Price. And, and Rowe Price was, um, had, had he written a book, he might have been as famous, if you will, as, as Graham and Dodd and so forth, because he said the same things, only not as much, same thing as far as buying a business, not trading stocks, um, only not so much from the standpoint of a value approach as much as a growth approach. So the way we like to differentiate it is to us, traditional value investing is more looking at the balance sheet, whereas growth investing is looking at the income statement, and what the opportunities are for growth in the business. So we're looking for growing businesses, businesses that can can grow their sales and ultimately their earnings. Um, and really with the idea that you know we're going to own businesses. In fact, the tagline in our shop is we're going to own through multiple market and economic cycles. So it's it's entirely normal for us to own companies measured in in years and sometimes many years. Um, we recently we sold a company last year that we owned for 23 years in our portfolio. Um, you don't hear that very often. Um, in fact, we're going through kind of a transition right now where we've had a number of companies that we've owned for 10 and 15 years that have done significantly well for us. And and we're now kind of realizing they're reaching that point of maturity and um, and we're, we're either selling them or in some cases we, we also do run a, an income strategy that's that just the, the, the criteria of which is we're really just trying to get a you know, like a four to six percent cash flow off of dividends uh, and interest if it's it should be a, a fixed income type position. But mostly it's it's actually, you know, dividend paying common stocks. And some of our old growth companies are now in our income strategy because they're still solid businesses paying good growing dividends. Uh, so sometimes we'll just transition, you know, old growth companies over into our income strategy. Uh, but more often than not, we're actually just moving away and looking for the next, you know, small company that's out there that that has the same you know, potential to maybe do what uh, its its predecessor did uh, over the previous 15 years. We're looking for the next 10 years. Nice. Well, that's actually a perfect segue because uh, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on today is, uh, you know, I wanted to kind of get your take on, you know, some of the performance that we saw in the stock market for 2019. And, you know, yeah, we're, we're already about a month in, but, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in hearing that. So, you know, 
like I said, even though we are about a month into this into this year, which 2020 now, you know, where we've already seen some, I, I say this lightly, some pretty interesting things happen uh, in the stock market. Um, you know, what what's what was your take on the stock market performance then for 2019? Yeah, so yeah, I think uh, obviously larger companies were the kind of in the driver's seat. Uh, everybody did well. I mean, uh, yeah, S and P was up over thirty percent. Um, S and P five hundred. Uh, the mid cap and small cap indices were up uh, in the mid to low twenty, so it didn't do quite as well as the large cap. But everything did pretty well. But let's not forget, um, as far as the averages are concerned, we came off a year in two thousand and eighteen where they all lost money. So I kind of laugh sometimes when we hear people talking about how wonderful the market has been. Well, it's, you know, kind of forgot about, you know, especially the fourth quarter of 2018, where the market was down something like 20 percent in, in, on average across the, the various averages. So, um, you know, I think that was more of a, a reality, actually, a reality check, if you will, that the market really should have been higher uh, than it had been. And I think some of the Certainly, the reaction of the fourth quarter of 2018 was way overblown. Um, but, you know, that's something that we've just grown to get used to or be accustomed to in the markets nowadays. Uh, the, the levels of volatility are, are, I would say, higher. I mean, you hear people say that all the time. And, and having been at this for you know, going in my, in my fourth decade now, you know, I, I can be one of those that's guilty of saying, oh, it didn't used to be like this in the old days. You know, it's way more volatile. Well, yeah, I mean, you certainly had volatile days back then, too. But it does seem to me be more, um, yeah, maybe maybe violent sometimes, uh, almost unreal. Um, I think it's a function of the amount of algorithmic kind of trading that's going on out there. Um, we kind of look at that as an opportunity. We don't really like it because we think it it's it's a reason why people will lose confidence in in markets. And I, when I say people, I mean the average investor. And I think one of the things that marks today's investment or or certainly stock market experience is that more or less gone are the folks that would trade their own accounts or invest their own accounts for them for themselves. Um, and I think that's kind of an unhealthy uh, thing. I, I I would. I would much prefer that there's folks out there that are looking at, at companies and and trying to you know make determinations as to what they think a company is worth and if they can make money in a company buying the outright stock themselves. We're just not seeing that um, the, the, with the advent of passive investing or so-called passive investing, uh, investing in indices anyway. Um, I think in many ways people have kind of thrown their hands up in the air and said, "Well, I want to participate in the market," quote unquote. Um, but I'm not sure not going to try and figure out what companies to buy because you just get whipsawed. And so the more of this whipsawing that we see, I think that ultimately ends up being less. Uh, I think it ends up being a negative overall. And so um, I'd much prefer seeing broader participation. But it is what it is. Um, we can take advantage when we see what we call the bots out there making their their moves, and you know they rip up a company that we we feel is very you know favorable over the long term, and we can buy it extremely cheaply sometimes when that's happening. So um, I, I think there's more of that that's been going on. I think 2019 was just simply sort of a, if you will, a, a reality check on that the market shouldn't have been beaten up as bad as it was in, in 2018, in particular the fourth quarter. And so this was a bounce back. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't see the market as being particularly I mean, we don't make market calls here. As I said, we're really more about buying the businesses and we're going to own them through market multi, multiple market cycles and economic cycles likely anyway. Um, so for us. Yeah, it, it really doesn't matter to us what's happening on the overall market. Um, but, I, you know, for what it's worth, that would be my assessment that things had, had maybe gotten a little too negative there towards the end of 2018. Uh, this was somewhat of a bounce back. Um, definitely not in the camp that's, you know, that you hear all the time in the in kind of the, the financial punditry, which is that, you know, we've had this amazing bull market. Um, well, yeah, if you pick March 9th, 2009 as your starting point, which was the bottom of the 0809 market and, and measured from there, yeah, it's been phenomenal. But, you know, I think you need to go back to at least the previous market cycle um, and pick some time, maybe not the top in March of 2000. Um, because if you did that, it really has been a pretty so-so market return over the 21st century. Um, you know, if you go back to maybe like 98 or 97 or 99, even um, you get a little bit better feel for that. You know, the market's kind of over that period of time done OK, but it's not insanely good. Um, so let's not get carried away. We've had two, you know, major market debacles so far in the 21st century. 
Um, and I think we're still trying to get our, frankly, get our, our feet back underneath us from those experiences that have now been, you know, they're now almost 20 years from the first one anyway, 20 years ago. So, so with all, all that said, with your assessment on, on the macro uh, economic look at 2019 at the stock market in general, you know, what were some of the trends that you saw that maybe helped influence uh, how you decided to construct your, your growth portfolio? Sure. Sure. Some of the trends have been going on for a long time. And, and I like to explain that the best the best way to explain sort of where we're coming from. in that is we look at the world in the in the in the um, through the lens of three of what we call schemas, demographics, business processes and technology. And we pretty much believe that everything fits somewhere in those schemas. And sometimes they fit in all three. Sometimes they fit in two. Sometimes they just fit in one. And when we're looking at those schemas, then we're building narratives based on what's happening with demographics, what's happening with technology, what ha what's happening with business processes. Um, and so some of those some of those narratives have been going on for a long time. Um, you know, for example, in technology, I mean, the, the continued build out of bandwidth capabilities that's been going on for, for you know, since the 90s. Uh, at least it's been in the it, it's been talked about. Um, Surprisingly, as much as the 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 2000 dot com tech telecom blow up sort of put a, a, a temporary, I would say, hold on that, um, and and it's somewhat to the detriment of the advancement of of building out bandwidth, um, as we saw many of the the technology tech telecom technology type companies that were sort of wrapped up in the dot com debacle. Dot com deserved to get hammered. Many of those telecom companies did not. But it, they did, and it took them a long time to recover, and it kind of put a, a damper on that build-out. Nonetheless, it still happened, and there was, there's been, and we have taken advantage of, you know, significant investment uh, narratives in optical networking, in you know that that con that continued build-out of bandwidth, whether it be companies that are um, directly involved in building that technology or companies around surrounding it you know even as simple as uh, the connector companies that provide the connectors that allow these data centers to to connect uh, within themselves and and between themselves um you know uh, if you if you look at at healthcare and demo, dem demographics as it relates to healthcare aging baby boom that's been a narrative that's that's driven investment themes for some time for us so those haven't changed for a while i mean they've been going on for a couple even more decades um, some of the more recent themes that we're seeing, um, let's take as long as we're mentioning healthcare, staying on healthcare. Uh, one of the more, some of the more recent narratives or themes coming off of narratives that we're seeing is, for example, in healthcare, uh, much more direct to consumer. Um, you know, with the you know kind of I'll say mess that's happened in in healthcare and the overall healthcare industry and the way things are paid for. That's that's just been a a, a cluster of a mess. But it's kind of interesting to watch how free enterprise has worked its way around that um, with a lot more direct health care to the consumer. You know, these these, um, for example, health health uh, service providers that are popping up that, you know, are, are not necessarily worried so much about whether or not you're getting reimbursed by uh, uh, an insurance carrier. It's, you know, you got a sniffle and you want to just go get it, get it checked out. You just go pop in and you pay whatever it takes cash wise to get uh, get taken care of and. Uh, you know those those kinds of ten trends are are driving other aspects of healthcare. Um, in home healthcare is becoming much more popular. Um, trying to and, and this makes sense in the in, in, in the interest of trying to reduce healthcare costs. We're seeing a lot more going on where um, they're trying trying to get much more healthcare happening right in the home. Um, and in fact, you know, studies have been, have shown that. Um, Patients respond better when they're at home rather than in a clinical environment uh, when they're trying to recover from a surgery, for example, or, or some sort of a, a healthcare um, mishap. So, uh, it built around those kinds of trends are investment opportunities. Um, medical devices continue to come out and impress us. Um, that's nothing new. Uh, that's also uh, uh, somewhat driven by the, the aging baby boom, you know, knees and hips and shoulder replacements and what have you. Um, we continue to be amazed by what we're seeing in the way of medical devices that are coming out these days. And there's lots of small companies uh, in our portfolio. It's something we've been focusing a lot on uh, and everything from you know, treatment to eye of eye diseases and 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 medical devices and, and procedures that are that are happening there to uh, respiratory. 
uh, companies that, that treat respiratory diseases and in, in, uh, respiratory, uh, acute respiratory um, problems. You know, somebody comes into a hospital, they can't breathe. You know, how, you, how you get oxygen to them. There's some, some neat things happening there with respect to medical devices. Um, as far as core technology is concerned, um, you know, we think that there's been uh, maybe perhaps a bit too much emphasis on things like um, AI and machine learning. Those things, things are great, um, but we think that ultimately it's not just about speed, um, and it, it, it can also it is also about uh, trying to provide you know, other other areas and other other angles to, to core technology. For example, um, analog semiconductors and what they're providing in in uh, advances in in automated automated uh, automated uh, excuse me automated vehicles. Say that over and over again, um, that uh, is super important. I mean, you can't, in other words, if you've got a car driving along and it's autonomous, um, you know, if it, it needs to be able to uh, determine whether or not there's a deer in front of you much very quickly, um, and it can't convert a picture into bits and bytes uh, that easily unless it has analog, uh, some sort of analog technology surrounding it. So we think there's there's great opportunities there. So, you know, that's you know, just kind of a, a bit of a an example or some examples of where in core technology, where in healthcare, um, what the demographic environment is doing in the way of driving some of those um, those investment narratives. Right. And the, and just to be clear, these are narratives that were true to you in 2019, and then also you're continuing to look for in 2020. Correct. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, you know. Nothing has changed that dramatically from 2019 to 2020. As I said, some of these themes have been going on for a couple of decades, right, of and course. we still think they're important. So there's some newer ones. Um, and I just, the, you know, the, the, some of those healthcare-related issues are some of the more newer uh, things on the horizon. But yeah, we, we were on them in 2019. We're on them again in 2020. Uh, I would say, from a core technology standpoint, maybe the most significant um, narrative. Uh, that that we're really looking into a lot, but can't say that we've made any specific, uh, or at least any significant specific investments in is is distributed computing or what what you know commonly blockchain is used to describe it. But it, what what it's really about is um, moving away from the public cloud um, and towards distributed computing or the cloud that's that's distributed out to multiple you know many 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 nodes. Um, it's what the whole the big, whole Bitcoin is 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 based upon. We think that going forward, there's going to be much more happening there. It's not particularly shown itself just yet, um, but we think that's that is looking forward. We think probably one of the most important investment narratives that will shape things over the course of the next say five to ten years, as far as core core technology is concerned. Um, again, it's not extremely obvious just yet. Um, but we think that that's uh, you know we're we're driving towards a, a an a, an era where you know the big giant public cloud companies and you know who they are um, may start to lose some of their clout in the in the economy and in the marketplace as concerns over security and privacy and things like that start to really they're already in the forefront with respect to the 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 negatives of public cloud. Um, you know, just the, the reality is, is, is the public cloud has been great for certain purposes, um, but it hasn't been able to stay, keep itself very secure. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's becoming more and more of an issue. And we think the, the solution to that ultimately is distributed ledger computing and the ability to be able to have, um, you know, blockchain type technology helping us in the areas of, of security and digital rights management and, and, and many, many of the things that um, having having everything clustered into one giant centralized public center, if you will, uh, which is all the public cloud is, um, it has its shortcomings. For sure. And, you know, another question I had for you, and, and this is from some of our communications that we had together via email, you know, you've stated that, and I quote, while small and mid-cap stocks clearly underperformed large company stocks in the general market this past year, for our growth portfolios, the best performing stocks came from the ranks of mid cap, small cap, and even micro cap companies, end quote. So I got to ask, why? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a great question. Um, and I'm not going to answer that with it's because they're small or mid or micro. Um, I mean, I think that's perhaps one of the biggest problems that we have in investing today. 
And, and one of the things that, frankly, I think is, has been a, a, um, a real shortcoming of our investment profession is this idea that it's all about, you know, which section of the market you're in. It's not that at all. The reason those companies have done well is they just happen to specifically be, you know, doing very well in their businesses. And, and you know, at the end of the day, and this is what you know, we like to say all the time, you know, our, our core growth strategy, we call it a core growth strategy um, simply because we can own any size company. And, you know, we will own a company if it's a larger company that we think can be a much, 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 much larger company. I get the greatest example of that for us was, you know, buying Amazon in like 2008, it, something like a 15 to $20 billion market cap. Um, we did finally sell it in 2018, 10 years later, you know, when it was like almost a $700 billion market cap. So, um, you know, we we're perfectly fine with it, buying a big company and have it get to be huge. Now, you don't find Amazon's very long. Um, another one that was similar for, uh, uh, to that for us was Salesforce, which we sold last year but owned for over 10 years and, and saw just phenomenal growth in what was already a pretty good sized company when we got it, but it became a, a behemoth. Um, NVIDIA is another one which we still own that we've owned for 17 years and bought it when it was very small and now it's very big and you know we still think it could potentially be a half a trillion dollar or, or more company. But the reality is you don't find those very often. So we're always going to look for smaller companies in front of fertile fields of, for, of future growth. Um, and the fact is it's, gonna, it's easier to grow a company from 500 million in sales to you know, 5 billion in sales than it is to grow a company from 5 billion in sales to 50 billion in sales. That's just a you know, law of large numbers kicks in. So those micro, small, mid cap companies that did well for us, um, it, it was simply because their company specific product, uh, you know, the, the, the products were, were specific to that, those companies um, kicked in and, and, and were really well accepted. Um, you know, one of the best performing companies for us last year, interestingly enough, was a company called Carvana, um, which is kind of revolutionizing, sort of becoming the Amazon of used car buying. Um, it's it's somewhat controversial because a lot of folks have liked Amazon over the many, many years, kept saying, well, they'll never make money, they'll never make money. Well, they're growing their business and they're, they're taking a huge, a huge piece of uh, a gigantic used car business without having to have any used car lots. We think Carvana still has a, a great growth story in front of it. Um, it's one of our core holdings. And uh, you know, it just gives, it's just an example of a company specific type of situation that's driving the, the, the price of that. It's not, it's not because of the size of the company. It's not even because of necessarily the industry that they're in. It's they're doing something very different and innovative that's working. Um, and they're growing very rapidly. The, yeah, the biggest, Concern there, and the biggest risk there is: can they execute? They're proving the model works. Can they execute on the model as they grow? Um, but yeah, the main point, though, I think that, that I would want to convey is: you know, when you talk about you know, why did the small, mid, and micro cap companies do better? Um, it just has nothing to do with the size of the company at this point. It has to do with what they are doing in their particular markets. You know, that's interesting. I mean, because you, you, as an investor. I feel like there's you have two sides of your brain, especially when you see just the frothiness that's gone on. I mean, uh, you know, for full disclosure, I'm not a shareholder in Tesla, but you look at a Tesla and you're just like, how do the how does this happen in three days? Sure. You know, but but well, my my main point in even bringing that up is because on one hand, you know, you say okay, it has nothing to do with you know the level that the company's at in terms of its asset class, but really that you know these at least maybe for you guys, you're finding companies that are just performing. They're, they're executing on their business model, you know, and, and as a result, their valuation is going up versus on the other hand, you know, uh, when you have a frothy market, you know, it seems to drive up valuations for a lot of these kind of growth type companies. So for you, you know, where do you, where do you draw the balance then for, you know, potential companies that you're looking to maybe even add to the portfolio? Yes, yeah, so and, are you see, and are you seeing the same thing? Yeah, great question, and the answer is yes. In that the, you know, when I said earlier that I think from a general market perspective, you know, even though I said we don't do market, you know, we don't make market calls, and we don't. But from a, just a, an observation, someone's been looking at this for over thirty years, the general market view that things are frothy, I think, is way overblown. That said, there are significantly frothy things going on in the market. Um, you know, when it, we also do venture capital. Uh, it's a smaller part of our business, but it's something we wanted to do for years. And part of 
what we did when we started Taylor for Gone was then open up the possibility of being able to, to set up a, a venture capital vehicle. And we did so within a couple of years of starting the company and have made very, um, very specific, very targeted investments in private companies. Um, part of it being because we we think venture capital is completely dysfunctional. I mean, what you've seen in happen in Silicon Valley with the funding of um, you know companies that frankly you wonder how they ever got funded, but then this like train starts going, and the the ball keeps rolling towards financing more and more losses. Um, you know, Uber comes to mind, and it's now even a public company, and the public markets are financing it. Um, it's frankly d- a disaster, I think. In, in the and in not not even a disaster in the making I think it's been a disaster because what's happened is is that the cap, that capital has been misallocated chasing all kinds of frankly I think ridiculous business models where the unit economics will never work out um, and what it's done is it's starved core technology you know real technology um, of the capital that it needs, we've seen it. We've seen it out there, and in, 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 as we've, you know, been in um, in private company investing over the last ten years or so, um, that and, and it's really a 21st century phenomenon. It was, a, you know, with the dot com blow up, um, you know, what what went with it was any semblance of sanity in in, in investing. I mean, everybody thought the dot com thing was a mess, and it was. But we've done the same thing with social networking and green and and you know crazy ideas like somehow delivering your food to your door is going to be worth billions and billions of dollars as a company. I mean, uh, meanwhile, we see all the time really incredible core technologies. And what I mean by that is, um, I'll, I'll say it with one statement: There's no, the silicon has left the Silicon Valley. Okay. Um, <laughs> When Silicon and I and I, I can say that because I grew up in the Silicon Valley. Okay, I watched all of this happen. You know, the, you know the heroes were the the guys that funded companies like Intel and and um, you know Nvidia and uh, Cisco Systems and all that. And and they really did some amazing things with technology. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons why. Uh, I think I think you know Robert, but I'll reiterate. You know, 18, roughly 18 to 20 percent of our portfolio, our core growth portfolio, is invested in Israel, and it's because they they didn't stop doing core technology in Israel, um, and in fact, Israel and Silicon Valley have historically been really attached at the hip. It's been a very symbiotic relationship. Um, I'm concerned to the extent that Silicon Valley has kind of, um, you know, left that. <laughs> left the room to some extent when it comes to truly financing core technology. You know, there's some signs that that's starting to change. There's some blockchain stuff that's happening there that's that's kind of cool. But in the aggregate, with the amount of money that has flown into some of these, um, you know, and I, I gave the, the general idea of what these businesses are previously, you know, the kind of money that's flowed into these things has just been insane. And I think that is, like I say, it's having real uh, ramifications right now. Um, you know, I, I call it the 8,000 to 4,000 problem, and we might have talked about that the last time we, we spoke, um, and that is the roughly number of companies, public companies that we've deteriorated to over the last 15 to 20 years. We've gone from 8,000 to 4,000 public companies. That's a problem. Um, there's regulatory reasons partly why that's that's happening, but I, but I also think it's, it's um, part and parcel to the same problem that we're seeing with uh, what you're talking about, the froth in some of these companies that, um, you know, have been getting massive amounts of private equity and venture capital investment, uh, you know, it, it really is, it's really a concern to us. I mean, we think the 8,000 to 4,000 problem is a big concern. Not too many people are talking about it, um, but that is a, that is a problem. Um, and, you know, I, 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 you know, we're seeing a little bit of a flurry in the IPO market, but it's nothing like it used to be. And, you know, just look, I just wrote an article, um, I don't know, about a month ago. Um, and it, the title of it was something to like, is it, are we reached peak unicorn yet? Um, and, and I talk about this problem and I talk about, um, you know, the differences between what companies were valued when Apple and Microsoft went public versus what, you know, Facebook and Google and, uh, the, the likes of those that were when they went public. I mean, you're talking about the difference between you know hundreds of millions and maybe a billion. I think Apple on its first day was like a billion in valuation um, versus 
you know, Facebook, what was a hundred billion dollars or something, and Google in the in the in the similar kind of situation. And I think, you know, that that was a real problem to me. Um, you know, for one thing, I even see the societal problem with that because the average person could never invest in those companies you know, if they wanted to when they were still small enough to actually make money in it. Um, uh, you know, Uber comes to mind, and we just talked about that more recently. Uh, you know, perhaps peak unicorn was the WeWork debacle. We'll see. Um, but, you know, that company was about to have Goldman Sachs, I think it was, take public, take it public at like an $80 billion valuation. And, it, you know, we, don't, we only know that once everybody finally got a look under the hood, there was no there there or what was there was certainly not worth $80 billion. So, I mean, I think these, these kinds of misallocations of capital have been happening here for the last, you know, 20 years. And, um, you know, I was asked recently, you know, what, what's the ultimate result of that? Or how does that finally play out? And I, I don't know. I don't necessarily think it has to be, nor, nor would we necessarily want it to be like a giant debacle. Um, it may just be, you know, that these companies just slowly start to die on the vine. And, and even if you look at the fact that, you know, the, S the top five companies in the S&P 500 are something like 18% of the value of the S&P 500. Um, and they're all public cloud companies. So that should tell you a little bit of something based on what I was saying earlier about distributed computing. Um, you know, as public cloud starts to run into its, its issues and its problems, it's, it's having them right now with respect to security, uh, you know, maybe, maybe that's gonna ultimately be where you look back 10 years from now and you know, your S&P 500 index fund has done you know, 4% a year or something, you know, and, and I'm not calling that a new normal. I'm just, I'm, I'm saying that it's entirely possible, especially if we can get some public companies to market to help drive the lower end, that you can still do well if you're looking for great companies coming from below. Yeah. Um, but I would be, I'd be a little bit more concerned about just buying the, you know, broad general market. And of course, that's self-serving. That's not what we do. But um, yeah, I, I think there's some pretty valid points for why um, we could, we could see some some adjustment there going forward. Gotcha. And uh, real quick, before I let you go, for full disclosure, um, you mentioned Uber, Intel, Cisco, uh, Apple, Facebook, Google. Uh, did I say Google twice? And uh, WeWork, just want to make sure, uh, full disclosure, you, do you own any shares in any of these companies? Full disclosure, we own none of those companies. Cool. All right. Well, Jerry, with that, I really do appreciate you taking the time today to share your insights and your thoughts on what's going on in the markets previously in 2019 and 2020. And Jerry, I'm sure we're going to talk again soon. Sounds good, Robert. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you.